Hello. We're just letting people in a little early because we will be having a large uh, audience today. So if you could, yeah, just come in and uh, let us know where you're tuning in from, what brought you here tonight. I am in East Hartford, Connecticut right now. Um, love to hear where, where everyone else is. We have about 40 people now, so we're still less than halfway there. Looks like we have someone from Lakeland, Florida. And West Haven as well, Avon. Westport, Dallas, Texas. Still waiting on a few more people to arrive before we get started. Have also someone else from Florida and Massachusetts, Salem, New Hampshire, slowly getting there. Well, looks like we have someone from Maryland as well, or we've had a couple people from Maryland, someone from White Plains, New York. All right, let's wait a few more seconds for people. I'm sure people will be arriving exactly at seven. Um, looks like we have someone from Charleston, South Carolina. Well, we wanted to visit Charleston. Uh, Warwick, New York. All right. We're at seven now, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, hi, I'm Omar Acevedo. I'm the Literary Program Coordinator at the Mark Twain House Museum, uh, House and Museum in Hartford, Connecticut, and I'm delighted to host tonight's program booth. First, I need to thank our sponsors. Our virtual programs are produced in part with support honoring the late Frank Lord. We are happy to honor his memory with these programs. We are also incredibly grateful to the Wish You Well Foundation and Connecticut Public WNPR for supporting all of our virtual programs. As a nonprofit, the Mark Twain House and Museum depends on contributions to share our enriching author programs like Booth, education initiatives, and other events with our community. If you can, please consider donating. I'll provide a link for that in the chat. Now I can tell you uh, a little bit more about tonight's program. We're welcoming uh, Karen Joy Fowler and Mallory, Mallory Howard for a discussion of <clears throat> Karen's book, <clears throat> excuse me, <laughs> um, Booth, a new novel, <clears throat> sorry. <laughs> sorry about that, folks. Um, a new novel about the family behind one of the most infamous figures in American history, John Wilkes Booth. <clears throat> Our author, Karen Joy Fowler, is the New York Times bestselling author of six novels, including the Jane Austen Book Club and We Are All Completely Beside Ourselves, which was the winner of the Penn Faulkner Award and shortlisted for the Man Booker Prize and four short story collections. She has been a Dublin um, IMPAC nominee, is the co-founder of the Otherwise Award and the current president of the Clarion Foundation, also known as Clarion San Diego. Our moderator is our very own Mallory Howard, who is the assistant curator here at the Mark Twain House and Museum. She's worked at the museum since 2008. Um, and when she is not um, hard at work uh, moderating our author programs, uh, she's uh, working on our upcoming exhibit for business or pleasure. Twain's Summer Sojourns, um, and that'll be opening up in about a month and a half. So if you want to see that exhibit, 
come and visit us. Um, we encourage you to have a conversation in the chat while Karen and Mallory are having their chat. If you have a specific question, you can post that directly into our Q&A section that's at the bottom uh, center, middle of the, of the screen. Um, there's something that says um, Q&A and it has two uh, chat boxes and you can put your question right in there at any time. Um, as soon as you think of it, just put it there. Um, please also know that you can click on live transcript to see live auto captioning of this event. Um, and finally, and perhaps most importantly, I'll be putting a link in the chat to purchase booth through our museum store. Your purchase will support our museum and our honored guest. Please sit back and enjoy, and I will turn this over to Karen and Mallory. All right, well, thank you so much, Omar. Uh, Karen, I am so excited to have this discussion with you. As I told you earlier, I picked up the book as soon as it came out. I read it in a weekend from cover to cover because I could not put it down. And so I am fangirling a little bit, being able to have the chance to discuss this book with you. So thank you so much for joining us tonight, first of all. Oh, thank you so much for those kind words. <laughs> So first and foremost, and I'm sure you get this question a lot as you've, as you've talked about the book, but what made you decide to tackle this particular family, this particular topic? So I had a kind of circuitous route to this book. Um, I started thinking about the Booth family, or I started thinking about John Wilkes, at least, when I wrote a short story many years ago called Standing Room Only. And the idea for the short story uh, came from a sort of dissatisfaction that I was having with some time travel stories that I was reading. I, I named no names, but I was finding it irritating that in so many of these stories, it, was, it appeared so effortless to go back 200 years in time and, you know, change of clothing and nobody knows that that you have come from the future. Um, I live in Santa Cruz, California. It's a tourist town. I feel that I can spot the tourists um, in, in the downtown area. And so, um, although I've never had a chance to put it to the test, I feel if I can spot someone from Kansas, I could probably spot someone from 200 years in the future. So I wrote Standing Room Only, um, takes place on the day of Lincoln's assassination. And a lot of time travelers have come to Washington, D.C. on that historic occasion. In order to write that story, I did a lot of research about the conspiracy uh, around the assassination. And I came across a, a story about Edwin Booth, John Wilkes Booth's uh, famous older brother. And the night he returned to the stage um, to perform for the first time after Lincoln's assassination. This was a, a contemporaneous account in the New York Times. It moved me very much. So I wrote a second story called Booth's Ghost. And then um, there was a, a very odd incident in their father's life, Junius Booth's life, um, that seemed to call out for yet another story. So by the time I came to the novel, I had been thinking and reading about the booths for quite some time. And my, and my initial impulse was, um, came, came about because of the, you know, terrible mass shootings that we are so prone to. I was thinking about the families of the shooters because I had been spending so much time already thinking about the booths. Those two things came together uh, with me wondering what the impact uh, and what the culpability of the family of John Wilkes Booth was um, in in uh, in the in the assassination. Oh, that's fascinating. I didn't know the answer to that question, so I started doing the research and thinking about writing a book. So you've been really immersed in booths for a while. For quite a while, yes. <laughs> And, and they are just a gift that keeps on giving. What oh, a strange family. Yes, 
Yes, they are. Um, and, it, you know, talking about all this, how long did it take for you to write the book from your initial stages? You know, obviously, I'm assuming you did research. And what was the process like? The process was a, a, an interrupted one. I, I started the book, um, as I said, in response to some of the mass shootings, I wrote, um, I don't know, maybe a hundred pages. I was doing research the whole time that I was writing. Um, and then um, when Trump was elected president, I just ground to a halt. It seemed to me that the book that I had been envisioning was not really very relevant to the moment. Um, it, it didn't seem like there was any point in me going on with it. And I, I put it down for more than a year. When I picked it back up, I realized, uh, well, my focus had kind of shifted from the mass shooters to the, um, the, the issues of the Civil War, issues which um, plague us to this day. You know, the problems that caused the Civil War are problems I feel we have never really addressed, much less solved. And so the book then did seem relevant to the moment in a way I had earlier decided it was not. So it's hard to answer the question of how long it took because I picked it up and put it down. But um, but if you overlook that interruption um, from the date I started to the date I finished, it was about eight years. Wow. Well, it's really funny that you mentioned that. And of course, working at the Twain house, my brain always jumps to Twain. But it, you talking about that actually reminds me um, of Twain when he's working on Huckleberry Finn. And he, you know, initially it was supposed to sort of be a sequel to Tom Sawyer and this boy's adventure story. And while he's researching his other book, Life on the Mississippi, he travels back to Missouri and sees the failures of Reconstruction and Jim Crow. And he puts Huckleberry Finn down over this period and then returns to it and changes it into such a drastically different book. So it's so funny that you mentioned kind of working on it, being interrupted, being connected and seeing what's going on in the world and then returning to it and, and kind of crafting it in a different way. So it's just kind of funny as an author of taking I those- I did not know breaks. that about Huckleberry Finn. So yes. I find that fascinating. Huckleberry Finn is always the example I use when I'm talking to book clubs and they're, complaining that some part of a book they've read was not good. They did not like the middle or they did not like the ending. And I always mention Huckleberry Finn as an example of a really, really great book with a really, really not great ending. <laughs> yep, we, we hear that all the time. <laughs> but that's just, it's interesting, just authors, you know, revisiting things like that. Um, now talking about researching and writing the book, was there something during that process that surprised you? There were many things that surprised me. There was, you know, um, I, I did not know very much about this family when I started. And um, I, I would say everything came as a surprise. I, I was surprised to learn that uh, John Wilkes Booth's father was a vegetarian and um, very, uh, very concerned about dam the damage done to animals uh, in the world and on the farm. There's a story that I think did not make it into the book, but that uh, a plow ran over the tail of a, a copperhead snake at one point um, on the farm, and that he insisted on putting the snake in a box and bringing it into the hearth and made his wife nurse it as it return to health and then re-release it into the field. So um, everything about Junius Booth was a surprise. He's really a larger than life, uh, bizarre character. I did not know that John Wilkes Booth's politics were not shared by the rest of the family. I did not know that Edwin was a great supporter of Lincoln and um, that uh, a few months before the assassination, uh, Edwin told John Wilkes Booth that he had voted for Lincoln's reelection, and they had such a such a row, such a fight, that Edwin threw 
John from the house, uh, and and John said that he would never return. A, a great bitterness between the two. So to know that John assassinated um, uh, Lincoln, who you know, who was everything he disliked politically, but also knew that this was a man that his brother really admired, adds just a, a sort of chilling personal note, I feel, to the whole thing. One of the things that surprised me is because there has been a lot of attention to this family, even though I had not been paying it, a lot of people are very interested in this family. And I was surprised given that and given how long people have been thinking and looking at this family, um, I was surprised that, that that we are still discovering new things that we did not know about them. Um, yeah, they, they are very interesting. What? How do you sort of see their legacy as a family? I mean, obviously it's very much tarnished by John Wilkes and his actions, but you know, how do you see them as a whole today and their legacy? Today, I'm afraid John is the legacy that, mm -hmm that most of the readers that I have encountered and that I have talked to know nothing about Edwin, although the family was very famous during their time. And that, and perhaps if you have some sort of interest or specialized knowledge of theater, you are aware um, that their father was considered the, uh, the premier American Shakespearean on the stage when he was alive and that Edwin was also um, at much admired for his genius that they were one of the most famous families in America. But I do feel that all of that it has been lost and the thing that remains is, is John. Do you think, did you get the sense that, because I've, reading in your book and, and the sort of the knowledge I've had of the Booth family that both Junius and Edwin were quite talented actors do you think John Wilkes just kind of went along with the family business or? I don't I, actually. I think that there oh. is a, a myth that John was not a good actor. Um, and I, I, I don't think that's true. I, there were many people who preferred the way John acted to the way Edwin acted. John was much more, I think, in the old tradition, a uh, kind of um, loud, bombastic sort of, you know, on the stage um, in a way that Edwin did not. And so uh, very much a matter of taste, which one you preferred. But um, but no, I think John was very talented. Uh, he, uh, he damaged his health towards the end of his very short life in a way that was likely to end his theatrical career, even if he had not ended it himself in such a dramatic way. So. Um, I don't think that he ever had the passion for it that Edwin did. I don't think that he ever saw it as his calling, but I think he was quite good at it. And apparently um, just absolute catnip to the women that you know, stage managers had to go out before his performances and beg the ladies to behave like ladies while he was on stage and they, they stood at the stage door to rip pieces of his clothing and hair off of him. Was, he was apparently quite the looker. <laughs> Easy on the eyes. Well, you know, you mentioned Junius and I, like you said, I think he's fascinating. And in your book, he, he is traveling, which he did quite often um, for these theatrical performances, yet he has such a strong hold and impact on his children, his family who are back home. Why do you think that is? I mean, even from afar, he seemed to really, you know, be impactful with them. I think that he was an enormously charismatic figure uh, that, you know, his children were all, they all adored him and, and they were all quite, uh, um, quite proud of him, you know, the, the idea that their father was a genius was a fixed point around which the family revolved. Um, and I also think, you know, he, as famous as he was for his genius on the stage, he was equally famous for his very public bouts of insanity. 
and uh, and I think for children that um, that unreliability, that idea that you never know which father you're going to get, actually increases the the influence and the impact in a way that a person who was more dependable uh, uh, would not would not achieve. Um, and I, I think you know he 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 thought very well of himself as well. <laughs> Yes, that seems to be definitely the case. Um, and, and I know you talk about his struggles with alcoholism. And there's obviously throughout the book a lot of tough topics like alcoholism, death, illness. Um, or slavery. Right. I, assassination. I know. It's, yes. it's a joy ride. <laughs> Were there any particular of those tough topics that you found really, really difficult to get through in writing about? I, you know, certainly slavery, I think, right. is always a painful to contemplate and, and um, you're always concerned that you're not giving it its due in some way. Um, I think that the, um, the kind of slavery that was on the Booth farm, and they did not own slaves themselves, but um, but they hired slaves to work the farm. Um, it, it just um, the the situation in Baltimore with regard to slavery was a very complicated one at that point. And there were slaves for life, but there were also term slaves. Baltimore was a, an easy and popular place to run to the north from, and in order to try to prevent. Uh, the enslaved people from taking advantage of that and trying to trying to get north um, compromises of various sorts were offered so that uh, your slavery might end when you were 30 years old or it might end when you were 60 years old or it might never end and uh, the family who uh, who worked most closely for the booths um, were a, a family, uh, the, uh, the couple uh, of Joe and Ann Hall. And I, I think they also have a fascinating story, although of course, there's a lot less data left behind about their lives, but they were both born into slavery. They both um, bought their way out of it. And, and, and yet this happened after they married or Anne's freedom happened after they married. And by Baltimore law, uh, children of an enslaved woman were, were enslaved and children of a free woman were free. And so you have this family, uh, quite a large uh, set of brothers and sisters and the older ones are all enslaved and the younger ones are all free. And this, this is just a, a hard to imagine and a painful thing to contemplate. Well, kind of sort of piggybacking on that um, and, and talking about those tough topics and going with your research as well, Rosalie, I felt very drawn to um, throughout the book. And I know there's not a lot of information out there about her, especially in comparison with Edwin or Asia. Um, and, and one of the, sent I wanted to read one of your quotes because I, I just loved it. Um, you say grief had destroyed Rosalie's parents. It seemed that God had reached down and scooped out the middle of the family as casually as if he were eating a watermelon. And I was just so like immersed in your words as you're speaking about that. But when you're trying to craft a personality for her and her thoughts and her actions, did you did that sort of give you a freedom of creativity now that you can finally get a little bit more loose with one of these characters in comparison to some of the others that needed to be a little bit more structured based on the research you found? Yeah, she's by far the most fictionalized character in the book. And since I'm quite used to creating characters uh, in a fictional novel, I was comfortable with that. There is so much information about Asia and Edwin that I didn't need to fictionalize them to nearly the same extent. So um, there are advantages both ways. In many ways, it was easier to do Edwin and Asia because there was so much information and I had a real sense 
of how they might respond to things. And often I had the actual letters or books that showed them responding to things. So I didn't have so much for Rosalie, but what I did have was um, pretty delightful. Uh, and the main anecdote that I began with in thinking about her as a character is uh, the fact that she, as a young girl, had a very, very brief romance with a lion tamer. She fell in love with a lion tamer and she believed that the lion tamer fell in love with her. This is less clear to me, but mm -hmm. this, uh, this romance carried her her whole life. Uh, you know, she lived in the memory of this very brief romance. And as an old woman, she liked to tell people about this past romance, this lost love, and she would always tell them that he was had been killed and eaten by his own lions, when in fact he had married someone else and was running a hotel in Ohio. And so the I, if you try to picture the sort of person who would rather tell people that her lost love had been killed and eaten by lions, uh, you know, the, the character really begins to form almost immediately just from that one bit of information. Wow. So would you say that's sort of the best of both worlds? I enjoyed it. And uh, a lot of people like Rosalie the best of the characters. And I always feel a little guilty about that because I think, well, yeah, you like her because I was able to make her up. And so I could make her nicer than okay. Asia was or than Edwin was where I, you know, I knew how nice they were. And it's not as nice as um, many readers would like. Uh, so, um, I, as I said, I always feel a little guilty when people tell me they like Rosalie best. I think um, <laughs> I just I just made her up. But, um, one of the amazing things to me, one of the really frustrating things about Rosalie, is that there was something physically wrong with her, and mm -hmm. that you never come across one of her brothers or sisters talking about her, where they don't mention poor Rosalie, Rosalie the invalid. Um, and yet um, there is no information about what exactly her infirmary was. Mm. Uh, you know, I looked and looked and looked and I talked to people who have looked longer and harder than I have. And uh, um, I know there's been a theory that she was feeble minded. That's clearly not the case because a couple letters of hers do survive and you know she's clearly a smart capable uh woman um it's possible that she was just a drunk and this was a polite way you know drinking certainly ran in the family so right. it's just a polite way of acknowledging that she had a drinking problem or it's possible that it was something else entirely but it was you know that seems like a critical piece of information and <laughs> right like a piece of information I should have been able to get, but I was not. Yeah, her, that's her frustrating. Her certificate mentioned scoliosis, so I went with that. I gave her scoliosis, but, um, and like I said, you know, it was under death certificate, so I didn't make it up whole cloth, but I don't really know. And I have read that uh, scoliosis on a death certificate in those days meant something different than it would mean to us now, so. I throw my hands into the air. I, <laughs> Sometimes you have to, right? I mean, it's not all, unfortunately, history did not produce everything in a nice wrapped up with a bow present. So you have to kind of go with what you, what you find and what you're able to uncover. Um, and someone had asked in the chat, which is a great point, could you tell us who Rosalie is? So do you mind mentioning oh, sure. uh, the siblings and you know a little bit about them? Sure, absolutely. Um, so the parents in, in the Booth family were Junius and Mary Ann. They were born in England and they ran away to America for reasons that will become clear if you read the book. Uh, and they had 10 children. Um, four of them died as children. And that's what Rosalie is referring to when she says that God scooped up the middle of her family as casually as if he were eating a watermelon. So there are two older children. The oldest boy is named after his father, Junius, but he's always called June in the family. Um, and Rosalie is the oldest girl. 
And then there's a gap of about 10 years, which is which was filled with other children, but they all died. And so Edwin is the next surviving child. John, uh, oh no, I'm sorry, Edwin, then Asia, uh, the, the younger of the sisters, and then John, and then Joe. And Joe is the baby of the family. And I feel, um, Having, you know, having spent a lot of time thinking about this family and looking at this family, I feel sort of done with them, with the exception of Joe, that Joe remains very mysterious. Um, a, a family friend uh, had a quote about Joe that he was either extremely stupid or he did a wonderful imitation of being extremely stupid. <laughs> he did become a doctor, but he, he's just... I mean, they're all bizarre, but he's bizarre in his own special Joe-like way. Uh, he, when um, Fort Sumter was fired on, he went as a doctor um, to, to help out at the scene, and he enlisted at that point in the Confederate Army, but he quickly became bored. He lasted really only a few weeks, and then he deserted, and he came back to Baltimore, at, where he joined the Union Army where he apparently anticipated that he would be immediately made an officer. And when he wasn't, he deserted the Union Army too. So I feel there cannot be very many people who within the course of a few months deserted both the Confederate and the right. Union Army. That's a great point. That is very interesting. Um, now, I something that I selfishly would love to see, and I don't know if you've ever thought about this, I feel like this would make a fantastic mini series learning about these interesting and fascinating people that are connected by family to this one of the darkest days in American history. Have you ever thought about how that might come to be? I cannot agree more. I think it would be a fabulous mini series and it's odd to me because this is my 7th book now. Every other book I have written, I have not thought would make a fantastic mini series. And yet they have all been optioned, you know, sometimes for as little as, you know, a hundred dollars, sometimes for a more sizable amount of money. It, with the exception of the Jane Austen Book Club, nothing ever came of any of these options, but they were all optioned. This one book that I think it would just be so easy to, to make into a compelling mini series, no one is interested in doing it, so. Well, I hope that changes because as soon as I finished the book, I thought, oh gosh, this would be so amazing on screen to turn your book into a mini series and watch it come to life through the screen. So I hope that changes and I will be the first person to throw confetti in the air if it comes to pass because- All right, well, I need you to do more than throw confetti in the air. I need you to get immediately on a plane to LA and start talking to people. That's Listen. what I need from you. I can start a letter writing campaign. We'll see what we can do because we need to make this happen. I would love it. <laughs> Stay tuned, everyone. I'll let you know. Um, so one of the other things I wanted to ask you about is um, what did you find the most challenging and difficult in writing the book? I felt... Um... I worried, you know, the, their lives are very eventful and uh, and in a kind of Forrest Gump way, they participated in or were witnesses to or were on the fringes of so many of the really big iconic moments of this period. So, you know, Edwin was in California uh, um, during the gold rush. Um, John was at the hanging of John Brown. Um, the, both John and Edwin uh, and Rosalie were in New York during the New York riots. So there, you know, there was a wealth of material. There were a great many incidents, all of which I found really compelling and, and powerful. But I worried that the book would feel like just one thing after another instead of having sort of a shape and momentum that it it would just seem like you know now we're here and now we're here and now we're here um 
And um, I credit my wonderful agents, um, Molly Friedrich and Lucy Carson for um, telling me that I should include sections about Lincoln. And so those were very late editions, but the book is threaded with short bits of information about where Lincoln was at the time that Edwin is doing this or Asia is doing that. And I hope, um, uh, I, I hope that kind of solved the problem, that it gave the book a sense of momentum that I worried it wouldn't have because you have these two figures that you, you know how it's going to end. You all know how it's going to end. Uh, eventually, they're going to come together. And so um, that, that was the problem I thought I had, and that was the solution that my agent suggested. And I think it works. I, I think it solves oh. the problem. Absolutely. And, and, you know, speaking on that, when you get towards the end of the book and you're kind of waiting to see how the family, how each of these people that you've been following through this story are finding out about what took place, how much of that did you have, have to fictionalize and how much of that um, was, was known as far as how the rest of the booths reacted when they heard the news about the assassination? I didn't have to fictionalize any of that. That's all pretty well documented. They all wrote about it. They all talked about it, um, with the exception of Rosalie, who was always so quiet. But, um, <laughs> you know, they, they were in different parts of the country. Um, June, the oldest son, was set to perform in Cincinnati, and he barely escaped being strung up by a lynch mob. He was staying at a hotel uh, people who worked in the hotel read the paper. Um, they they heard uh, a crowd forming. People were coming for him, and they hit him um, for the day. He he had to remain in a in a in a hidden place in this hotel. Uh, well, the people who worked in the hotel told the mob that he had left, that he was no longer there. Um, uh, Joe was coming back from Australia, so he got the news on a boat. And uh, at first there was a, a telegram, not to him personally, but uh, just alerting people on the boat that Lincoln had been killed and by a man named Booth. But he told himself that that was not such an uncommon name um, initially. Uh, but the more he thought about it, um, by the time they reached the next port and got the fuller story, he had figured out for himself that it was probably going to be John. Um, Edwin had just performed, uh, and um, he said, he, you know, he, he came home, he went to bed, he was awakened in the morning by one of his servants and, who told him, and then he said he felt like he'd been hit in the head with a hammer. And Asia was pregnant uh, with twins. She was at home um, and um, federal agents came to, uh, partly to protect her and partly to, with suspicions that she might be implicated. I mean, they, had, they were all under suspicion right. of being implicated. So yeah, that's all well documented that I didn't have to make any of that up. Now, speaking about the siblings, as you're learning about them through your research or you're writing about them, um, were you drawn to any of the siblings, any of the Booth family members in particular? Did you empathize or have sympathy for any of them as you were working on this project? I had sympathy for most of them. Um, I, I said, you know, that I was able to make Rosalie more likable than Asia and more likable than Edwin, but that does not mean I did not like Asia and Edwin. Um, Asia is the hardest to like, I think, but she's such a vivid figure. Uh, you know, she's just such a person. And I felt that she was the best educated and the smartest of the Booth siblings. And that the fact that she was a woman had um, prevented her from making the sort of success that her brothers had. I think that she would have been an incredible figure on the stage if she had not believed that actresses were basically prostitutes in nicer clothes. Um, 
So, you know, as I said, there's a lot about her. I mean, she certainly had a temper. She held a grudge forever. There are many things um, that you make you think, well, maybe, maybe I could do a dinner party with her, but not a weekend. Um, <laughs> But I did like her. Edwin, um, I liked enormously. I was I was working with my writing group as I was working on the book. I would pass them chapters as I finished them. And they were very upset that Edwin, when he married Mary Devlin, that he made a condition of his marrying her, that she quit the stage. And she was clearly also a very talented actress. Um, and my writing group just kept saying, well, now I don't like him so much. <laughs> can, can he not do that? Can he not do that? And I thought, well, I wish you and I both right. wished he hadn't done that. And yet, there it is. Would have been nice if he hadn't given her a venereal disease as well. But there it is. Exactly. Because sometimes facts are what they are. <laughs> <laughs> Did you get a chance to visit uh, Gramercy Park and see... Uh, I've heard, I, I've actually visited myself years ago at the Players Club because Twain was one of the incorporators uh, along with Edwin Booth for this Players Club in New York City. And I believe they said that the room is left as he left it. Did you have a chance to go visit there? And if not, do you want to? I would love to. And I did not have a chance to go visit there. I, I did visit Tudor Hall, the house that they lived in for a number of years. I visited um, the cemetery where mm -hmm. most of them are buried and I wanted to go to the Players Club, but um, but I was not able to make that happen. I have been told by people who have been there that literally it is the way he left it in that they don't even clean it, that it is cobwebby and dusty and kind of gross. <laughs> I think there's even a human skull in there from one of his uh, performances. Oh, yeah. There's yeah. also apparently, you know, a picture of John Wilkes um, on the bed stand, which is interesting because after the assassination, Edwin did not mention John's name again um, for the most part. There, there's an anecdote that a young actress asked Edwin how many brothers and sisters he had. And the minute she said it, she heard this kind of hush and realized that she had made a mistake, but that he was very kind. And he answered her. He said, well, let's see, you know, let's count them. And he went through them all, but he left John out. Um, I just want to remind people we're getting close to the time for Q&A. So if you, I know that there's quite a few questions in there already, but if you have a question in the back of your mind, now is your chance to go ahead and put it in the Q&A and we'll be starting that in just a few minutes. So sort of last call for questions. Um, what I also found really fascinating, you mentioned this in the notes section of your book, is that you didn't wanna give John Wilkes Booth attention. Um, do you think by, you know, now that the book is, is out and do you feel like you really succeeded at that? I think that was always a fool's errand, you know, a, a kind of mind trick I was playing on myself that I, I felt that I did not like John Wilkes Booth. Um, go figure. I don't think right. he was a nice person. Um, nope. And um, and I thought that he had really craved attention. And so, uh, you know, I didn't want to give it to him. But in all honesty, I think we all know that I would not have been writing about this family if he hadn't assassinated Lincoln. So it's it was kind of a, a, always a pretense that he was not going to be central in some way. I never did use him as a point of view character, partly because uh, I never have felt that I understood him. I think that um, he, uh, you know, that there are so many factors that went into making him who who he became uh, and there it, it's hard for me to tease apart which ones are important and which ones aren't but he's he strikes me as a very unlikely figure for an assassin because he was successful he was talented he was handsome he was um socially deft people loved him everywhere he went 
people loved him. So this is not the profile that you expect to find when you're looking at somebody who is going to become a killer. Right. Uh, he was obviously enormously moved, um, completely undone by the suffering of white Southerners during the Civil War and completely unmoved by the suffering of black people under slavery. Um, he had, you know, he, he, he loved dogs and he hated cats. He had, he had his, his likes and his dislikes and he could not move into the, the areas where his sympathies did not lie or he did not try to move into those areas. Right. So, um, you know, in the end, he, he remains a mystery to me and I did not wish to, I, I was willing to pretend that I understood Rosalie when I don't, um, but I was not willing to pretend that I understand John when I don't. Makes sense. Um, sort of last question, I wanna ask you a, a, a couple last minute fun ones, but the last one really connected with Booth is, you know, was there anything that you either had to take out of the book or that maybe didn't make it in that you wish you could have put in? Uh, I have a couple of answers to that. First of all, you know, um, I, I have talked about how much information there was. <laughs> so the trick in researching this book was not needing more information in general, but was separating out what information seemed reliable. That, you know, the minute John Wilkes Booth murdered Abraham Lincoln, a sort of mythology grew up around these people and these events. And there are a lot of stories that are in a lot of sources that have been repeated and repeated and repeated that don't seem to be true. And it was with great regret that I had to give up some of the ones I wanted um, because in the end, I thought that they were not actually true. <laughs> but one thing that I did not know and that I wish I had known, um, a, a man named Terry Alford who wrote just a magnificent uh, biography of John Wilkes Booth was enormously helpful to me. He, he had been researching this family for 30 years. He could not have been more generous in sharing what he had uncovered and what he believed to be true. And uh, he's just a meticulous researcher. So after I published Booth, he published a second book, which I highly recommend. Um, and it's about both the, the Lincoln family and the Booth family and their experiences with mediums in general. You know, both families lost many, most of their children or many of their children. And the Civil War period was a high market time for mediums and people who spoke to the dead. So that's mainly what his book is about. But in it, he says that, um, that Tad Lincoln, uh, who was at this point still alive, uh, loved to hang around Ford's theater. And that, so that as a child, he, he knew John Wilkes Booth and, um, you know, sort of hung out with him. And I, I did not know that when I was writing the book, I would love to have been able to include that. Well, thank you so much. As Omar comes back on the screen, uh, any writing projects, anything you're working on now that you're excited about, or are you still kind of coming I down? Wish, I so time? wish I had a different answer. I could <laughs> pretend, I could make something up, but I'm really having trouble finding my next project. And that I usually have a kind of gap period between books, but this has been a really long one. This is beginning to distress me. So I am I feel that my best books have been ideas that somebody else gave me and I am depending on somebody here, someone in the chat room to tell me what to write next. Listen, we can convince you to do a Mark Twain thing next. So, <laughs> well, uh, as Omar gets ready for questions, I cannot recommend this book enough. It, it, is, it was my favorite book of the year. I finished it quicker than I finished any book before. So I highly recommend purchasing a co signed copy. 
uh, from our museum gift shop and enjoying it for yourself because it is really a gem. And I just want to thank you again, uh, Karen, as we jump into the Q&A. Oh, thank you. Thanks, Mallory. Um, Karen, looks like there are a couple of questions about um, about the uh, Booth's mother, Mary Ann. Um, someone says, um, lost it here. Let me just get it here. Um, they say, um, do you think that in being true to her beliefs and convictions, Mary Ann was a heroic figure? I guess, well, that's the question. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Mary Ann, the mother? Yeah. Um, I, I feel that, um, you know, Marianne was so besotted with John. He was obviously both parents' favorite son, and uh, she just doted on him, as did his sisters. Um, that uh, if there's culpability, I, I think it, some of it might lie there, that they, they persuaded him that he was incredibly special, that he was a person of destiny. The fact that the whole family was so steeped in Shakespeare too, I think gave them all kind of outsized sense of what they might accomplish, or, you know, that they could, that they saw themselves as large figures with uh, powerful impacts possible to them. So I, Marianne seems to me a very yielding sort of person who was actually quite mistreated by her husband and yet never stood up to him in any way. So I think that um, her suffering was pretty heroic. I don't think she ever recovered from the deaths of the early children and she was certainly finished off by John killing Abraham Lincoln. I don't think there was much happiness in her life. And I think that she, she suffered gracefully, but I would not say that she was heroic. And it's funny that you mention um, her treatment of John because a couple of people are asking if, um, if family dynamics with um, uh, with Junius and uh, the older brothers um, having more fame than John could have pushed him to 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 assassinating to 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 becoming a murderer um, and 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 being a, a young the second of uh, second youngest of, of the ten children um, as well. Um, do you think that that had uh, his position in the family line had anything to do or 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 the fame that that perhaps his other siblings were enjoying? I think I think that was a factor. Um, I don't think that he was ever el uh, jealous of June, who was a, a, a merely competent actor. I don't think that June ever posed any sort of competition to John, but his relationship with Edwin was clearly very problematic. As I said, you know, when he murdered Lincoln, he did so knowing he was killing someone his brother admired enormously. So, um, and he did, you know, he did go into a bar shortly before the assassination and tell the people in the bar that he would soon be the most famous man in America. So um, I, I do think his, his desire for fame, his jealousy of his brother, I think all of those things were factors, but I also think you know, he was just a passionate white supremacist and he could not forgive Lincoln for um, for the fact that uh, black people who had served in the Union Army were going to be allowed to vote. He, he, he uh, said on many occasions that uh, he thought slavery was not only the best thing to ever happen for white people, but that it was also the best thing to ever happen for black people as well. So I think that he, he, his sympathies were entirely with the South. As I said, he was just undone by the damage that the Union Army did when they went through the South. And I think, I think those were all heartfelt positions. Um, you add to that that he was drunk the whole week before the assassination. You add to that that there 
was clearly a strain of insanity that ran through the family. Um, you add to that that he seems possibly to have been kind of a puppet in the hands of other older Confederates who, who saw him as a, a useful, uh, useful fool. Um, all of those things are in play. Uh, I, as I said, I, I can't, myself, I can't really untangle which ones mattered the most. And maybe in the end, it doesn't really matter since I'm not trying to understand him. I am, um, I am trying, the argument I am trying to make in the book is that people who don't murder presidents can be just as interesting as people who do. And that um, I do not think that John is even in the top three most interesting people in this family. Um, well, shifting a little bit away from John, um, where and how, where slash how did you find information on spiritualist John Worth Edmonds and medium Laura Edwards? I, um, there, there's a figure who's, pretty prominent in Edwin's story named, named Adam Badeau. And he uh, was a theater critic originally, um, but he, he wrote a kind of critic at large sort of column. He called himself the Vagabond and he covered a number of items. And as he was a very close friend, possibly lover of Edwin Booth, uh, as Edwin's star rose, Adam became more and more inclined to write things about Edwin. And he attended several of the sessions with mediums and he left written accounts of his own experiences during them and a, a kind of list of the mediums that Edwin had gone to. So having those names, I went, you know, I went to research those people as well. Um, someone's also asking, in the process of your research, did you encounter any information about Maggie Mitchell, um, who was the lover of John Wilkes Booth um, and a popular uh, comic actress? I don't actually remember um, Maggie Mitchell's name in particular, but, you know, the number of actresses who were in love with John Wilkes and who after the assassination claimed to have been married to him or to have had his child or to have had an affair with him. That's not a, that's not an exclusive club there. And I, I am quite certain that he did leave children behind that we, um, that were not identified at the time as his children, but he was an active young man. <laughs> Well, someone asks a, a, a question. I, they use the term ancestors, but I think they meant descendants. Were there any descendants that you were able to contact? I'm, I'm always curious about that myself. If, if uh, you know, fa famous person, this famous person has any descendants. Um, I, I think there are quite a few Booth's descendants. I did not contact any of them. I live sort of in terror that they will read the book and I don't know how they will react, but it is interesting to me that at least one of the Booth descendants is an actor. Uh, he, he has played some smallish roles on television and, and some medium-sized roles on television. And it's just interesting that that legacy continues. Yes, uh, Scott mentions that for actors and theater people, uh, Edwin Junius's um, stage work is still remembered and revered and Edwin's heartbreak over his brother's actions helped the Booth legacy rise above to some degree over the association. That was just a, a, um, a comment. Um, from I think school. that's quite true. I, I just attended a, the Folger Shakespeare Library, did an event about the book, and they, um, they have a lot of artifacts from Edwin's theatrical career, which they uh, trotted out to show us all of which were quite wonderful so yes I think in theatrical circles Edwin is well remembered I just don't think he's remembered in the general population the way he might mm -hmm. be you know I think mm -hmm. that it's I cannot think of another actor who who would have meant so much uh, to the American people in in because 
uh, not only of his gifts, but of his association with John. Um, Lucy um, asks, in eight years of crafting this, I'm guessing there were ult ultimately some anecdotes and stories that didn't make it into the final book. Was there anything on the cutting room floor, um, as you will, um, that you still miss? Um, and would want readers to know about even if it got edited from the final copy? Well, Lucy is my agent, so she is well oh. aware that the section <laughs> that takes place at Niagara Falls was once much longer, filled with anecdotes and uh, episodes and and uh, touristy kinds of information about what it would have been like to visit Niagara Falls at that time. Um, and there was a, a sort of universal decision uh, that this was not necessary information and that the story seemed to be bogging down pretty severely at this point. So I believe that to be the case. I think the book is much improved by cutting those sections, but I do think it is a shame that I was not able to tell you all about the hermit who lived at Niagara Falls. and. Uh, how he lived and how he died and where he came from, um, all fascinating information that tragically had nothing to do with the booths and therefore had to be taken out of the book. You might have to send me some of the uh, snippets from there because my mother visited Niagara Falls last year and has since brought up many times how shocking <laughs> it was, uh, how nice. How Ni Niagara Falls, the falls are beautiful, but 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 uh, the surrounding area is not. <laughs> so. it's not. And it's a shame, I think. <laughs> it's a shame because you want to feel so awed and uplifted, and yet you're surrounded by schlock, which prevents you from feeling. So I see that Joseph Mendoza has asked if there was an association of John with the Knights of the Golden Circle. And yes, there absolutely was. And that is who I was referring to when I said it was possible he had just been a puppet in the hands of older, smarter men um, that I was referring to the Knights of the Golden Circle, which was a group um, planning to start another slave holding country uh, south of the border. Mm, yes, I've seen, I, I, um... I follow some alternative history message boards and, and I've seen uh, some people following that thread of, of people setting up a diff different countries in, in other places like that. <laughs> um, and um, Stephen, I guess we'll, we'll end with, uh, with Stephen who uh, recommends Stephen writing- taking me up on the challenge. And also yeah, writing a book about Charles a new, Wilson Field. A new idea for a book. I will take it under advisement, Stephen, thank you. I will go look. Any evidence that uh, John Wilkes was homosexual? I, I, as I said, found that with Edwin. I did not find it with John Wilkes. Um, Where do you think John Wilkes Booth got those racist ideas? I think they came from boarding school. I think that boarding schools are responsible for a great many of the world's ills. And John was sent to a very um, high toned boarding school where he hobnobbed with the sons of white planters and slave owners. And I think that um, uh, he, he was at an impressionable age and, and something um, very traumatic happened while he was there. One of the fathers of one of his friends uh, was murdered quite famously in the Christiana uh, episode. Uh, he had gone to Christiana, Pennsylvania to retrieve runaway slaves and he was killed in doing so. And John was very, all his life, very, very upset about the injustice of this death. Um, often talked about what a close friend his son had been, although later in life, he seems to have forgotten the name of this very, very close friend, which morphed over many tellings into something unrecognizable. But the actual name was Gorsuch, a name that we all know 
ourselves. <laughs> so we'll 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 close it out there with that uh, contemporary um, connection. Uh, thank you so much, Karen, uh, for oh, thank for you being all. Here. Thank you so much for being here and for the questions. Yes. You go by the book. I just put the link yes. in the chat again. And uh, Karen, when you make your way to Gramercy Park to finally visit that room, I also hope that you will plan a side trip to come visit us at the Twain House so we can show you around and maybe some ideals will sprout from your visit. You never know. I would love to do that. Mark Twain is just a remarkable figure, I think. I have always found him compelling and fascinating and very much ahead of his time in yes. all his work. Um, uh, as we were talking earlier, my only complaint is his inability to see the genius of Jane Austen, which is <laughs> troubling, a very troubling fact about Mark Twain. A lot of people agree with you, so you're, yes, you're not alone. Absolutely. <laughs> yes, please, please come visit us. We'd love to host you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, to the audience, if you, if you want to join us again for future free virtual programs, we'll have uh, Empire of Isis Stone um, on February 21st um, about an ill-fated Arctic expedition, one of the last. Um, and you can also join us on February 23rd, where um, uh, author will be discussing his new biography of Edgar Allan Poe. Um, so uh, please join us for those as well. Um, thanks again. Have a great night. Thank you. Good night. Good night.